Good evening, everyone. I guess it's uh, night over there, right? It's uh, morning, very early morning here. Um, my name is Nariak Segura. As uh, Dr. Nuguroho introduced me, I, I'm a piano professor at the University of North Dakota. So that's why I put a title there, so you know what it is. Because sometimes when I say North Dakota, people have no idea what country it is, first of all. So I just wanted to um, explain that's in the United States, right in the middle of the country and a little bit of northern side as we are uh, bordering with Canada. So it's very north side. Anyway, um, I like to do a analytical so on and explanation, historical artifacts and so on. Well, um, that can be interesting, but I think my interest more lies in looking through the history and how you interpret, how you fit yourself in the history because eventually we all become history, part of the history. And we learn things by looking at the past and reflect on, then uh, we think of what to do right now. So such as you know, when we play music or Beethoven, what do we do about it? So one thing that uh, captivated me the more is rather than just analyzing the music, is I will let the Dr. Nuguroho take care of that portion because he's expert in that, um, is to focus on one element of this, which is the Beethoven's metronome. Uh, why Beethoven and the metronome is that the metronome was invented about the time that the Beethoven was alive, but that was after Mo was Mozart was alive, and that was after Haydn was alive. So basically the Beethoven was a major, first major composer in history who used metronome. I hope everybody knew this, or if you didn't know, it's a uh, welcome, now you know about it. So then oftentimes uh, he put metronome markings, sometimes during the composition or after the composition he did. Uh, there are many speculation that he must have been wrong to put the wrong metronome timings because some of them too fast and impossible to play at the tempo that he indicated. So then it's that um, speculation or uh, doubts, conspiracy theory and a bunch of things going on. And that's what I'm trying to explain to today. And, but nothing too difficult context in this, but I just wanted to introduce. Uh, um, here you go. So um, there's a pianist musicologist, Peter Statlin mentioned that 66 out of a total of 135 metronome markings are absolutely fast and thus impossibly wrong. Now, I don't know how many of you heard this, but um, so Beethoven um, finally got a metronome in 1850, 15. So very, you know, much closer to the end of his life. So then he got it and he was very excited about it, but it was a love and a hate relationship. I'll explain you more. But anyway, then he started adding uh, metronome marking to some of the older pieces, such as the republication of uh, symphonies, one to eight. And, but some of them very, very difficult to put, uh, played together in that certain tempo that he indicated. Um, then the very well-known examples, uh, Symphony Number no. Nine, the uh, Trio of a Scherzo Movement, and a Turkish March in the Finale, and um, also for among the pianists, the, the most one that we know is the Hammerklavier Sonata, uh, the fast movement, uh, slow movement is here fine, but the uh, outer movements and plus the third movement is just so fast, it's insane to play, and unfortunately, this is the only one among all the piano solo pieces that he put up metronome markings, and this is the only one. So unfortunately, that's the only one reference we have, um, but we know that it's almost impossible to play. So that's where the question comes in. Why did he put it and is it the right tempo? So first of all, I just wanted to look at what is tempo. And I discussed this with my student and most of the time, but you see is that the, um, this is the typical answer that we get. Well, tempo is the speed of a pace of a given piece, and it is typically indicated with instruction at the end of a start of a piece 
often with the Italian terms such as Allegro, Vivace, and so on. And it's usually measured in beats per minute, so called a BPM. And what happens when the metronome marking is not available? The performer should know knowledge, uh, use the knowledge of a musical style, and the genre, and the musical common sense to decide on the proper tempo. The key to finding the correct tempo is identify the right character for the piece. So, as I said, the metronome was invented and introduced in the public in a early 19th century. So until that point, so let's say Bach, Scarlatti, Handel, all those baroque composers did not have this the great invention of a metronome. How did you people used to teach certain tempo so that you don't get the wrong character? Well, the music was not so available like now. So music was only for aristocrats, the people who can afford um, instrument to buy. And so hence, um, composers are only, uh, the music are only limited to the high end people, I should say. So um, composers had access to the people who wanted to learn and perform these pieces. And it was very rare that you publish, they publish a piece and somebody that you don't know will play your piece. That was a very rare opportunity so that why do you have to put so many things? Hence, when you look at the original version of a Bach's uh, Well Tempered Clavier, Invention, Symphonia, you don't see anything. Uh, decorations, dynamics, of course there was no dynamics, but lots of information that we see as the classical music is missing. And that's because composers just used to teach. So that why do you have to put so many indications? So, Tempo is the same case. They just put Allegro, Largo, or whatever the character which describes the character of the piece, not necessarily really the speed of the tempo or of the music. They, they, they never put it in a score. So that was the case. And of course, you know all this. So the left side is what people used to see. Grave, Lento, Largo, Adagio, Andante. Uh, moderato, allegro, vivace, presto, you all know this. But when you think of tempo, what do we generally think of? This is the right side, the numbers. And that's the pulse, and that's what we refer to rather than the numbers. Oh, okay. You accidentally muted yourself, Nariaki. I think now you are muted. Okay, now you are fine. No, I didn't do anything. I didn't touch anything. <laughs> I suddenly got muted. I don't know why. But anyway, I hope people are able to hear me. And you're the fine. most of the thing I've been talking about is on the screen anyway. So I, should, I think it should be okay. So what changed in the history about this uh, tempo indication? It's because of the publication. Sorry, it's one page. Sorry. So the publication, how it happened, it was the Industrial Revolution in England. So the many factories are made, many things are made in mass productions. So including the piano, and the publication was one of them. So, so that's why I put it here, the publication of music score made the tempo indication very important. So and then Beethoven was the first composer who did not serve as a con composer in history. Well, Mozart kind of was in a way because he used to work at uh, in a court, and he got kicked out, as you probably know the history about it. Uh, but Beethoven's case, he from the beginning did not serve for anyone particular. Um, so that's why I said that he was a, a first uh, composer, uh, earning his money. As I said here, that he earned money mostly from teaching, commission of new compositions, and the publication of his score. So as he made his music widely available to the public, he wanted to write very detailed instructions on his scores, including tempo instructions, articulation, dynamics, and expressions. So that's why I'm sure you have heard from your teachers. Studying, about, uh, studying Beethoven's score accurately, de in detail, why it's important is because of this. Beethoven was really the first composer who did the detailed work on the score, including tempo indications. So, of course, 
Beethoven was not much detail, particularly if you look at the late Beethoven sonatas. So detail in notes, articulations. Um, sometimes you find a 64 second note, 128 second notes. It's crazy. So details in his music. So, of course, once he found out about this new invention of a metronome, he wants to be precise. He put the metronome marking and he did not even give a room to wiggle around. And that's how Beethoven was. Anyway, moving on to the guy who invented metronome. It's called a Melzo. It's a German inventor, engineer, and showman, best known for manufacturing a metronome, um, the several music playing auto automaton. He worked with Beethoven to compose a piece of music for one of his inventions. Um, trying to remember, it was the uh, Opus. 91, I believe it was, uh, Beethoven composed a piece of Wellington's victory. It's about a war and there's uh, the music that he wants to portray and there's a symphony version available too. Uh, but he cre specifically cre created this for machine, which that you turn it on, then you can hear the cannons and uh, you can hear the gunfires and so that it gives you lots of effect of uh, wartime you know, uh, war zone effect, I guess. So th that's what he created. And they toured around with this machine with the Beethoven's composition. So anyway, um, so Beethoven got to know a uh, Melzo in uh, about 1813. And so they became a good friend and Beethoven wrote a piece and they toured around. It was good. However, when we are talking about a cop, they are talking about the copyrights. They started fighting who has the right to perform and who gets the commission and so on. And they started fighting and the Beethoven suit Meltzel and Meltzel was like, ah, yeah, but he's great. So I don't want to fight with him. So he decided to give him a gift, which happened to be the metronome. And Beethoven happened to love this device, even though he was almost deaf, but uh, he was it gives him the right to choose certain tempo, set the right tempo, and so on. So he was very happy with this invention. So that's Beethoven's, uh, how do I say, first time meeting with a metronome. But anyway, uh, outside note, uh, this male cell, even though we know him as an inventor of a metronome, but he's actually not an inventor. So that's why I said the best known for manufacturing a metronome, but I didn't write inventor. And that's a very important point because he actually stole it from somebody else, Finkel. And um, Belto actually went to uh, Holland. Sorry, Holland, not Poland. So in Dutch guy to meet. And he met uh, Winkel and asked him, okay, I would like to know how to make a metronome and so on. And Winkel said, no. So Meltzer went back to his country and he started manufacturing it just by imitating um, Winkel's metronome. So, but back then uh, copyright was very lightly taken. So Winkel didn't do anything. So while that was happening, Meltzer went to get the copyrights from many different countries. Back then the international copyrights law didn't exist so that uh, you can get the copyrights from uh, every different country. So that's what he did. So now after that uh, Melzo, everybody believed that he invented the metronome, but it's not the right story. All right. Now the important point of the Beethoven tempo indication. Why is it often too fast? One, his deafness permitted to hear or feel the right tempo. And tempo only came from his imagination. So um, back then, I'm trying to see the notes here. So um, he was using this, of course, the uh, pendulum uh, metronome. I don't know how many of you have that the pendulum system, which is the uh, this one, the photo that I, uh, the pictures that I put here. So unlike that uh, we use the phone right now and then the metronome, the uh, machinery, so that doesn't give, really give you the sense of uh, beat by feel. 
but Beethoven watched how it moved and he put on the piano and he could feel it. And as also he's doing that with the um, putting things in his ear because he was not completely deaf at this point yet. So he put a long stick into his ear and the other side is touching the metronome or the piano so that he could hear the vibration of the metronome. So that's how he used to catch uh, metronome tempo. But how can you correctly perceive that? Particularly, let's say if you are, he was in a, trying to uh, play hamaklavier on the piano. How can he do put the stick in his ear and listen to the vibration while he's playing? Unless you, even if he gets the help from somebody else, it's basically impossible. So what he used to do is he had this uh, nephew, Carl, who used to help him with the metronome. So Beethoven just played, let's say, symphony, piano piece, whatever it is, and asked Carl what's the tempo on the metronome. So that's probably one of the reasons why there's a tempo discrepancy there that uh, he imagined that he's doing certain things and also the people perceive a little differently and so on. So that's where the tempo might have been uh, misfigured. Two, his piano was lighter, hence it was easier to play. So piano, <coughs> orchestra, orchestra was much smaller in size. It's not like a Mahler symphony. And also orchestra instrument, <coughs> such as, uh, let's say, uh, woodwinds made of entirely with wood. So it did not, let's say, produce like a flute, like a metallic, very strong sound, lots of resonance. Uh, string instrument, the bow was the still uh, 18th century style, which is the edges of uh, shallow. You know, right now the modern ones, the middle part is the uh, uh, tapered, then outside is strong so that you have more tensions. So that bow was not really created back then. So the orchestra was very quiet. String instruments are always quiet. So in general, the people preferred a little lighter and easier to play. And I will talk about this a little bit later that the preference for tempo because of that is that the people, uh, people started favoring more faster tempo music. And also if you think of that if the uh, instrument did not have good resonance, like such as uh, Beethoven's older pianos compared to our modern piano, um, then you don't have a resonance, then you have a lot of silence. So why not speed up so that you can entertain people? So hence the music became faster and faster, and that seems to be the trend back then. Uh, but of course it started changing afterwards, which I will explain to you. Now, tempo trends in Europe was also the fact. And of course, I'm talking about Mozart and Clementi, which is a little bit uh, previous generation. And you might have heard that they had a first piano competition in history. So they played for each other in front of a uh, king and they, I think they had two times that they met and played for each other. And there's a very interesting uh, Mozart comment uh, here. So current, according to Mozart, Clementi writes, presto over sonata or even prestissimo and place it himself a little in common time. So obviously for Mozart, Clementi performance sounded much slower than how it's indicated on the score. So why is this this? Is this the Mozart preference? It's actually the music in a certain part of the uh, Europe. There was a trend to play faster and and some country preferred a little slower. So such as um, Vienna was much faster tempo. So where Mozart was located, where Clementi uh, most of the time is in England uh, or France. So then these countries, people used to play much slower tempo. Italy was also the other country which used to play slow. However, the inland of Europe and center in Austria. Uh, people used to play much faster tempos, hence uh, they perceive differently. So earlier I talked about the tempo, Allegro, you know, Vivace and so on. So for Mozart, um, Vivace is supposed to be Vivace, but for Clementi, Vivace, is, this is fast. 
But for Mozart, that was only Allegro tempo. So the uh, trend, in the, depending on the country, it was completely different uh, back then. Um, so Beethoven was in Vienna, obviously, so he preferred fast tempo. And the instrument also helped to play light, so that he was able to play fast. So that's the other things. Um, just extra information here. So this is after Beethoven. So the Romantic period, what happened is actually very interesting. <coughs> so during the Baroque to Classical period, the tempo was getting faster and faster and faster. More notes. And Romantic period, after the appearance of Listen Wagner, that they reversed this trend of a fast performance. And so, for example, there's a record of a list conducted to Beethoven symphonies in public, and took, he took much slower tempo than indicated. But then there was a record of <coughs> these performances were very uh, received with a positive review. So it made sense to the public because it was easy to listen to and so on. And there's the same record of a Wagner doing the similar attempt in music. And I remember um, I was working for uh, Professor Jano Starker, uh, as a very a legendary cellist, and he used to tell me about um, the experience that he used to he used to have with um, Enescu, composer from uh, Romania, and that the composer explained to Mr. Starker, saying that yes, I have experience in playing with Brahms. And I witnessed and I heard that the Brahms used to put lots of rubatos and lots of uh, tempo rubatos everywhere and everything was kind of slow, almost like you're feeling drunk. And he demonstrated for me. And as a matter of fact, if you look up uh, only recording of Brahms voice and playing is now available on YouTube. And you hear lots of rubato in his performance of uh, Hungarian Rhapsody No. 1. Um, so at the end of Romanticism, it was really everybody was playing everything very slow with lots of rubatos. Okay, the last thing but not least, preference for tempo. Over tempo changes over time. So this is a good example of this. Um, do you see that the opus number on the left and the tempo indications here? Now the three people made this uh, tempo in with a tempo indication that they publicized Beethoven Sonata set. And as you can see, let's say even um, yeah, you can just see the numbers, the difference from right to left. So like even like looking at the journey right now, that first publication proper performance to Simrock uh, edition that you see the different numbers for the tempo indication for every sonatas, almost every sonatas. And why? Beethoven indicated certain tempo, Czerny, in case of Czerny, he studied with Beethoven. He heard Beethoven perform when he was younger and he was not still deaf. Czerny performed, probably studied many times with Beethoven, so he knew about how it's supposed to be. Why did he change the tempo indications? when he made a different publications. So is that because of this a preference? So to give you the idea, this is a very good example of a Brahms talking about tempo marking. So this is a quote from uh, a Brahms letter to Clara Schumann, and they were compiling um, Robert Schumann's uh, piano pieces and trying to publicate and publish it. And Clara asked, okay, so what tempo marking should we put for these pieces? And the Brahms answer is, to give metronome marking immediately for dozens of works as you wish seems to be not possible. In any case, you must allow the works to lie for at least a year and examine it periodically. You then write a new numbers each time and finally have the best solution. <coughs> so even <laughs> Brahms is saying, it's probably not a wise idea to decide right away so that you don't accidentally put wrong tempo markings. So remember about the Beethoven did not have much of time. He was just so excited and he put a measure on a marking for every piece that uh, he could, uh, able, he was able to publish. So was it the right thing to do? And here's the answer. And 
ideally, you know, the metronome numbers should be tested many times. You know, you perform and you hear other play and adjust it several times. And so that you're not influenced by in one particular occasion of a performance or experiment so that you don't put the wrong numbers. So from this, you can tell that Cherny changed the number because probably he expanded he played many times or he taught his students and realized, oh, maybe this is not the right tempo marking. So he changed it. So that's the assumption that we have. Uh, not 100% sure, but we perceive music very differently. I used to play, well, Apasionata, actually. Uh, I played 2003. And I told uh, Dr. Nuguroho that uh, I was insanely playing fast and I could barely manage it. Now I'm much older. And do I play like that? No. Do I enjoy playing like that? No. And I have a different enjoyment of playing a certain tempo after studying Beethoven more and more. And I appreciate and I learn, um, first of all, managing my playing is one and also understanding the music much better rather than fast tempo there is more expression that i can include so that's why i choose different tempo now but anyway i would like to conclude my topic because otherwise it sounds like it's um doesn't mean anything because i just presented a bunch of tempo discrepancies but i believe as a music dedicatee like we all all of us have a responsibility to keep investigating music, including tempo, articulation, dynamics, every aspect of it. And through history and with the scores and so on, books, we learn more than experience that we gain from this will become another history for somebody else. So basically, by us investigating Beethoven's music or anybody else's music, we are creating, we're helping to create the new history for the, uh, for the next generation. So I encourage everybody to keep studying and enjoy at the same time. And these uh, problems that we find in the history basically triggers everybody to instigate and uh, to practice or study about it. And that uh, is what we need. We need to keep doing this. So that's where I would like to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nariaki. Uh, really awesome knowledge that we all learned, right? Uh, because I learned as well. I didn't know so many things about this historical fact. Uh, uh, and you are presenting this in a very, very factual, like uh, really making sense. Uh, I just want to share a little bit um, like I one time, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, I heard it already that Beethoven put the metronome marking too fast. But uh, then the explanations uh, is like this. Oh, at that time, the metronome does not tick as fast well as today. But it does not make sense because uh, we are using the minutes, right? The 60 BPM, bit per minute. Uh, unless Earth may be uh, traveling the suns at a slower tempo, <laughs> then uh, that the minutes becomes longer at a time. But uh, it does not make sense. So I did not buy it. But today, you are presenting it in a very, very uh, scientific way. And I really like that, the fact that, yeah, first that he already deaf by that time, and then the piano uh, that was slighter, and then the tendency in the classical period, uh, that's very important uh, for you to remember, yeah, because uh, soon uh, Dr. Noreki has the quiz for you, and he is very generous in offering also a complimentary masterclass too, those who listen very well to his lectures. But before uh, proceeding to the quiz, let me uh, offer you if, if you have any questions, because this is a very, very important issue as well. Uh, I really like what you said. Uh, 
Dr. Nariaki about uh, that it's so much more about the character and not uh, the speed uh, about uh, choosing the tempo that we got to write a character. Uh, and I think uh, it's as well also our personality. And you said like not to be influenced by a certain uh, performance as well too. I think we need to be true to ourselves as well. Not like, oh, he play fast and I have to be able to play as fast as, or faster no. than him, <laughs> like that, yeah. Hence, there is no speeding ticket. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, I give speeding ticket a lot to my students, uh, but uh, <laughs> but if you are playing fast for the wrong reasons, uh, you you can play fast if it, you have the right reason. And as long as we do have uh, responsibility uh, behind the choices that we make, and this is really really interesting. And Brahms' comment is very very profound. Yeah, and which is true. I mean, uh, in the period of our lives, uh, well, you are becoming more wise, old man, Nariaki. Uh, maybe <laughs> I'm becoming <laughs> more wild. You are wiser and I'm wilder, <laughs> old man. We were uh, classmates in Bloomington and we hang out a lot. Uh, I think I did not hang out with many people. I'm kind of nerd. And I think he is like the very few people I hang out with. Uh, OK, any questions oh, here in the chat room? Let me I check. saw one question yeah. somewhere. Go ahead, please, Dr. Nariaki. So when the Beethoven composed a song, how did he know which note he was what was suitable for his the song? Meaning the pitch, I'm assuming. Uh, I think that came from his imagination. Uh, I guess this is a part uh, part of the perfect pitch story, <laughs> Doctor Nugroho and I have been talking about. I forget. Did you, yeah, by okay. the way, did you earn the perfect pitch? <laughs> <laughs> because you were telling me for a while that uh, it's good to have a perfect pitch so that you can learn music faster. That's, uh, well, that's assumption. <laughs> we have to investigate <laughs> as you <laughs> advise us. <laughs> well, I am in terms of memorization, so far I'm finding if you do a solfege, it helps. Because usually in the memorization, you're referring on to, uh, you know, digital and you know, a physical, and that's one aspect and oral and then um, visual. So you remember the score and the song. So these three aspects are very important. Uh, but if you can say the pitch, you know, do, da, fa, do, da, fa, da, fa. sorry, I don't, I'm not a good singer. So, but you can say, the pitch that you're going to play, it's easier to memorize. So that definitely uh, plays important part of it. So I'm assuming Beethoven had a perfect pitch as well, so that he knew exactly what music he was uh, composing. And as a matter of fact, at the symphony number no. nine, by the time he did not have hearing ability. So he had to know what pitch he was writing for. So, but where it's coming from, I guess it's all in his imagination. But that's where that everybody says that Beethoven was great, and in other words, crazy. Mm -hmm. Because he could not hear whatever he was playing, but he was able to compose. So imagine that uh, right now, you lose hearing ability suddenly, and you're supposed to write something. And that's what the Beethoven did. So that's why Beethoven was great. Can we do it? We don't know. I probably put the wrong notes, wrong harmony, and then there's no way you can check it. But he did not make that mistake. So I guess he knew what he was writing and what he was hearing, even though he was not be able to hear. That's my answer. And maybe your advice to, to listen to your theory teachers and be better at your theory classes here, yeah, everyone, because so many of young 
students like you underestimate the power of your theory or solvage classes. Uh, and I think it does not matter whether you are using the systems of fixed dough or movable dough, but you do have a systems of the nodes recognitions. And I think that is important, uh, right? Uh, it so is. As, yeah, as Dr. Nariaki mentions that, yeah, you kind of really know the connections uh, among so many nodes that you have. So they are not just randomly axis, but they are there in a certain order. And that order is the system that you learn from your theory teachers. Yeah, so listen better your theory teachers, guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there are many theory teachers here that will be thanking me. <laughs> they usually just practice before the royal exams, Nariaki, and then like here, you know the royal exam systems here. Like, yes. Uh, and if you if you want to go above grade five, you have to pass the theory five. But then after that, they stop learning theory. They just learn a uh, theory up to the level five, and then that's it. And they, they, it's forgotten. Uh, so anyway well uh time is going, moving very fast uh, so i am going to operate uh dr nariaki's quiz from here everybody hey, one more question i, I can okay. answer this question very quickly mm -hmm. so it's about tempo rubato and so on i'm assuming so i can just give you i actually prepped this uh phrase and i forgot to mention it so it's about uh Andy Ferner Geliebte. It's the Opus 98 at the song set. And he used the same uh, song uh, for Opus 109 and the second movement. Uh, well, third movement, I should say, the slow movement. Um, so, anyway, so this singer came and uh, asked Beethoven, What's the tempo for this uh, first? And he said, Oh, a quarter note equals to 60. But there was a con uh, continuation to that. So he gave a tempo. He said, 60 quarter note for the first measure he was very specific to the first measure and after that don't stick to the met metronome so that was his very specific answer he answered <coughs> so <coughs> what in that means excuse me is that he loved metronome so that remember about earlier i was talking about love and hate relationship is he loved the fact the metronome gives a very precise tempo However, he did not like people to play with a metronome because then your performance becomes so mechanical, metronomical. So you're supposed to reflect with your phrase and the dynamics and so on so that there's a little bit of a rubato exists in music naturally. However, keep in mind your tempo needs to be steady. So that's what he meant by saying first major 60. So that's my answer to this question. I hope this did I answer right? <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> so that's what I tell my students too. Practice with a metronome when it's necessary, but feel the tempo. That's the only reason why you're doing it. But don't rely on it all the time so that your performance becomes completely metronomical. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. Reason. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a one more question. Uh, Mr. Nariaki, when is the best time to use metronome? I guess anytime when you are looking at the score before touching the piano, mm -hmm. I guess you want to imagine how you want to sound your music. So maybe you're going through, you know, these days, and you know, people used to say, like, don't listen to anybody's performance before you learn the music. Well, right now we have so many performances available, YouTube, CDs. So listen many. Then you decide what your plan is going to be. So then you set your tempo. So that's when you can use it. And when you have a bunch of 16 notes, you want to regulate your 16 notes. So you use metronome to do that. And Beethoven was also known for playing pretty much straight from beginning to the end. And it's very difficult to do because every section has a completely different character, note value. It's very difficult to play same tempo. So you check with a metronome that you feel a very consistent tempo or not from the beginning to the end. And that's what I do. And most importantly, I know this is not so much about the Beethoven per se, but what I do is that I actually practice all the time at the 80% of a performance tempo. Mm -hmm. And why this is, is that uh, when you're on a stage, what is the beat that you're referring to? 
heartbeat. And if you want to carry your metronome to the backstage, right? And then in the practice room, you do the same metronome, right? However, your heart is the one that you're constantly unconsciously listening to the beat all the time. And you're calm right here. You're thinking, yes, it's about 60. On the backstage, what's your heartbeat? Maybe 120. <laughs> so what do you think of 80% of the tempo in your practice room on the backstage? It's very different. So that's why you want to plan in the practice room. I'm going to play slightly slower than what you plan. Right? And then you always practice that tempo. In a concert, if anything happens, you might go up to 90%. You can still manage. So try not to do 100% always. Never aim for 100% of a tempo all the time. And that's my advice to everybody when we prepare for a performance. It so cool. and for, for that, you know, you need a metronome to see, <laughs> understand what is what tempo you are using. So all the time I use metronome at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end. So metronome can be a very helpful tool for any part of your practice. Yeah, uh, you mentioned good things that uh, metronome is very important, but don't be metronomic. That was mm -hmm. your uh, tonight's uh, precious word for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> one more, one more question, Nariaki. This is a very interesting topic. Uh, so many questions. Yeah. Where is that? Uh, this one? It's it is interesting that the trend of fast tempo. Some people tend to have a me. Well, so I think the current trend, um, I remember um, I actually uh, talked to, uh, oh, I'm sure Dr. Nuguroho, you remember this name? Dr. Bug Holder. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody actually should know his name right now, right? Because he's on uh, the Grout and Paliska Burkholder book right now, right? The mm -hmm. history book. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I talked to him about the history and so on. We are talking about it just in general. And he mentioned a very interesting thing because he's a very uh, well-known scholar. He studies about lots about history, writing a bunch of books. And he told me that uh, there's a trend in and that actually cycles around. So sometimes that, that let's in case of a tempo, speed up and speed down, up and down. And every 200 years, it's make a cycle. I it's a very interesting <laughs> things. Yeah, it was a very interesting thing to hear that the, him talking about it. And so yes, there is a certain trend. And right now, everything is speeding up because of the computer technology, cars, train, airplane. Uh, well, I guess a pandemic kind of slowed us down in a way, but look how we are connected right now from Indonesia to United States. In a way, that's making faster than letters or telephone. So I guess people's preference is tending to go for faster tempo. And that's definitely that the one thing we have to observe so that when you look at the contemporary music, classical, non-classical, it doesn't really matter. You hear lots of fast music and that's what the people like. However, after hearing so much of that, mm -hmm. you get tired. So then you need some refreshing kind of music. And that's when you started looking into a slower tempo music, I guess. And I myself also have not just a <clears throat> favor. I mean, I don't only favor the fast music. I guess it's a balance. It's like, a, I don't know, going to a restaurant and you don't want to order only with a Oh yeah, I remember you took me to uh, uh, the restaurant with lots of peanut butter sauce, yeah. peanut sauce. <laughs> and I enjoyed it because it was the first time in Indonesia and it was great. But after a while I was like, oh, a little too much because peanut is very heavy, it's very mm. pasty. Um, so then I needed a drink. So I think the balance is very important to uh, music as well that it's not completely heavy, too fast, but balance. Um, that's what I would say, I guess. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's the tendency of people. Uh, just like uh, we one time we are so proud of the color photos 
but then now in the modern days people love go to back to black and white uh, so and then mm. same with the uh, eye glasses too <laughs> from sure. the, getting smaller and smaller and then big and then smaller so uh we do change and as well as the baroque uh, when music were subjective and then to the classical people get tired of the subjectivity in the baroque music and then go to objectivity and then the rom and then they get tired of the objectivity then go to the romantic romantic uh, period and then they get tired of the romanticism so then comes the prokofiev stravinsky and so on who are anti romanticism or well they are still rachmaninov who are still <laughs> love the romantic one more question uh, there Ayaki. Yes, I'm looking maybe, on it. Maybe last uh, questions here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we will stay up uh, all night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is right. Yeah. So, um, there's one more thing that we have to consider. I know that we look at Beethoven's score or manuscript as basically as a Bible, most important document so that we can refer to. However, it was created by human. Nobody's perfect. Beethoven was not God. So we basically help each other and trying to figure out what is the best. So that's why I said, and even the Brahm said, let it sit, let it experiment so that you don't just come to the one conclusion in a hurry then rather you try and experiment so that you find the right tempo. So that's probably one proof that I have to say. Or my saying, my teachers, uh, Mr. Neriki used to like it. It's like, even if you don't agree with it, come up with the reason why you in a Beethoven might have done that. So of course in a tempo, if it's half the tempo or twice the tempo, of course you can't do that. You can't justify it, but maybe you can justify why you need to play slower the one what the Beethoven indicated. So that justification is very important. Yeah, our reasoning, our responsibility for the choices we make, right? Uh, because we are not just, uh, oh, okay, I like it, but I don't know why I just like it. I think that's not professionalism. Uh, well, um, maybe that's the last question. I think everybody will agree. We should invite Dr. Nariaki again, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, we will maybe maybe I will rest and give him all the time for him. <laughs> uh, well, I hope the pandemic is over soon, and then like you can visit me back here to Indonesia. Sure. Yeah? <laughs>